Let's take a linear programming problem in standard form. Minimize C transpose x subject to Ax equal to b, x greater than or equal to 0, where A is a node arc incidence matrix. Recall that a node arc incidence matrix has the following property. It's a matrix whose entries are all 0, minus 1, or 1, and in each column there is exactly 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. In a separate video, we saw how we could represent such a matrix using a director graph. So let's look at an example. Suppose that my matrix is the following. Okay. And suppose that the rows are labeled V1 up to V4 and the columns E1 up to E4. Then a director graph representing this matrix is as follows. Now suppose I have a vector B, say 3, 1, minus 2, minus 2. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place these values onto these nodes. So the first value for B will be placed alongside the node V1, and so on. What I'm going to do now is going to give an interpretation of these constraints Ax equal to B, x greater than 0, on this picture. So let me first write out the constraints. So here are the constraints written out using these problem data. I'm sorry, this picture is wrong. So this should be E4 and this should be E3. Now I want you to concentrate on node V1. There are two arcs coming out of V1, E1 and E4. And the coefficients of X1 and X4 are both positive. Whereas the arc coming into V1, which is E3, the coefficient of X3 is negative. Remember that each Xi corresponds to the arc Ei. And if I look at the node V3, there's nothing coming out of V3 but two arcs going into V3. It's E2 and E4. So the coefficients of X2 and X4 are negative. And you can gather that for every node, the arcs coming out will have positive coefficient in their corresponding X variables. And for the arcs coming in, the corresponding X variables will have negative coefficient. And so one interpretation of this constraint is as follows. Imagine that each arc carry a certain amount of goods. And the number at each node represents the net amount of goods coming out of that node. So for example, V1 has a net of three units of goods coming out of it. Whereas V4 has a net amount of minus two units of goods coming out of it. And that means we can think of positive numbers, like 3, to be surpluses at the associated nodes, whereas negative number, we can regard it as a demand. And we want to be able to ship things around on these arcs so that these surpluses and these demands are met. So what I want is, I want things coming out of E1 and E4, subtracting the things coming into V1 through E3 to be 3. And for V4, if I put 1 on E3, I better have 3 on E1 because I want the net amount coming out to be negative 2. That means I want 2 more units coming in than going out. And if we put a cost per unit of good on each arc, say CI on EI, and ask for a solution minimizing this, say C transpose X, where, uh, say my C, is 3, 1, 0, 4. So 3, x1, plus x2, plus 4, x4, subject to this. We are looking for a way to ship goods on these arcs so that the conditions of surpluses and demands are met. And we want to do that at minimum cost. And such a problem is called an uncapacitated network flow problem. Oftentimes, when you're thinking of goods, they cannot be fractional. So we might be asking for solutions that have only integer entries, for example. This is no longer a linear programming problem, but it's an integer linear programming problem because we have linear constraints, except that the variables are constrained to be integers. But the nice thing is, if all the entries in B are integers, then we saw that since A is a totally unimodular matrix, 
every extreme point solution is going to have only integer entries. And so we get this condition for free. So this will come for free as long as we solve for an optimal extreme point solution. So integer requirements pose no difficulty as long as the b values are all in integers. Since this is a problem in standard form, it is tempting to use the simplex method on this. But we can't use it right away because, uh, because we need to start with a basic feasible solution to a system whose coefficient matrix has full row rank. So we first need to eliminate redundant rows, and we could use Gaussian elimination for that. But there's a shortcut for doing that. Suppose that the graph that represents the node incidence matrix is in one piece. That means it is connected. Then there's only one redundant row, and we can delete any one of these rows. The resulting matrix will have four row rank. For example, if I delete the second row here, the remaining three rows are linear independent. Or if I choose to delete the fourth row, the first three rows are going to be linear independent. So this is a property that, that can be proved. So again, if the graph representing the no arc incidence matrix is in one piece, then all you have to do is choose one row and delete it. The resulting rows will be linear independent. And then we can find a basis and start the simplex method. Another interesting property is that if you're looking for a basis, what you're looking for is a tree. So if your no arc incidence matrix has n rows, and say the graph is in one piece, what we'll be looking for is going to be n minus 1 entries in the basis. And in this case, we're looking for three elements to make up a basis. And I said that all you need to do is look for a tree. So what is a tree? You can think of a tree as a collection of arcs. The number of arcs has to be the same as the number of elements that we need to put in the basis, such that you cannot find a loop within the arc set. So in this case, I'm choosing E1, E2, and E4. Clearly, there's no loop formed from these green arcs. Whereas if I choose E1, E2, and E3, I have a problem. E1 and E3 form a loop. Now, the direction of the arcs does not matter when we identify loops. So even if E3 points the other way, if I have chosen E1, I cannot choose E3 to form a basis. And it's clear because if you look at the column corresponding E1 and a column corresponding E3, they add up to the zero column. And if you flip the direction of E3, I'm just flipping the sign of the column corresponding to E3. Again, E1 and E3 will be linearly dependent. So bases correspond to trees. And using that observation, it is possible to simplify the simplex method. And I'll leave the simplification as an exercise. Now what happens if the graph representing the matrix A is not in one piece? Suppose there are two pieces. If you play around with this, you'll realize that you can actually decompose the problem into two. You can write down this minimization problem on this first piece, and then you can write down this problem for the second piece, and you can solve them independently. And so it poses no difficulty, whether it's one piece or five pieces. So if you have five pieces, you're just solving five individual one-piece problems. And you can apply the simplex method on each individual piece.